Good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to uh, our panelists and our audience, wherever you happen to be uh, tuning in from. We're delighted to have this conversation uh, about five foreign affairs articles and through, those, through these articles, uh, the war in Ukraine that began on the 24th of, of, of February. Um, I'll begin with just very uh, quick introductions to the uh, to the three of us, and we'll begin today's conversation by uh, passing the baton to uh, to Justin for a few comments about uh, the five essays in question, and then we'll have back and forth and some conversation and discussion. After which, we will very much welcome questions from the audience, which you can send in through the the Q and A function. And if you have a question on your mind, you don't have to wait until we formally ask for questions. You can just send them in, and we'll get to it uh, in due course. So we're delighted to have uh, you know, two uh, guests with us today for a Monterey conversation, and uh, I'm also delighted to be joining them uh, as one of the uh, organizers of the Monterey conversations. Uh, and I myself am Michael Kimmage, professor of history at the Catholic University uh, and uh, uh, a non-resident fellow uh, at the German Marshall Fund. You're joined as well by Liana Fix from uh, Berlin, uh, my very valued co-author uh, in these five pieces. Uh, it's true that Liana was also recently uh, a non, or rather a resident fellow at the German Marshall Fund. It's sort of under those auspices that we began writing these articles, but Liana is also program director uh, at the Kerber Foundation uh, in Berlin, uh, and Justin Vogt is executive editor uh, at Foreign Affairs. So the three of us have been working together quite a bit uh, online and over email. Uh, and I have to say, uh, Liana and Justin, it's just a great pleasure to see you uh, as close to in person as we can manage in this form virtual format uh, and to have the chance to talk through uh, these essays um, uh, and through them, uh, the question of how we can write about this war, how we can conceptualize it, how we can think of it, historical context, and the difficult work of making certain predictions about the future, which is really what each of these five essays uh, is about. So, uh, Justin, the floor is yours, uh, and uh, uh, it's just delightful to be with the three of you. Thanks so much, Michael. I feel the same way. Uh, good morning to everyone who's joining us from wherever you are. Uh, as Michael said, I'm Justin Vogt. I'm executive editor of Foreign Affairs. Um, I'm really excited about having this conversation, um, not just because it's a fascinating topic, but because uh, Michael and Liana are two scholars who really embody what foreign affairs is all about. And that is applying expertise to matters of public importance in a way that's accessible and compelling for those of us who are not experts and who are not academics. And sometimes the best way to do that is to ask and maybe ideally answer the most basic question or questions. Uh, and this is something that I think a lot of contemporary scholarship sometimes lose a sight of. Um, so in February, as it looked like Russia was preparing to invade Ukraine, and you'll recall, I'm sure that many of us, me included, um, did not actually think this would happen. Uh, Liana and Michael started asking these important questions, which are also very simple questions. What if Russia wins? What if it loses? What if Ukraine wins? What if it loses? And what, by the way, do we mean uh, by win and lose, victory and defeat in this context? What happens if the parties strike a deal? What happens if the war just goes on and on? And they've dealt with these questions in a really rigorous way. They've drawn on IR theory, they've drawn on historical analysis, uh, but they also dealt with the questions in a practical way by asking what each of those scenarios might mean for makers in Washington, or in Kyiv, in Moscow, in European capitals, uh, in Beijing, all over the world, really. And the result has been what I think is just this terrific running series that we call the Ukraine Scenarios, and which you can find on the Foreign Affairs website, um, or you can just Google the Ukraine Scenarios, it comes up. We're up to five entries. We might be done, I don't know, you never say never. Um, but we seem, I think we've, we've kind of covered the waterfront on possible scenarios, as far as I can tell. Um, but it's just been a real pleasure to work uh, with the two of you. Uh, I think of Liana and Michael as, as real models uh, for how scholars and academics can contribute to public discourse. The war in Ukraine has often been cast as this fight for liberal values. We can talk about whether that's a, the best way to understand it. Um, but to the extent that that is true, um, I think that by applying reason 
and knowledge to matters of public importance, to really tricky questions. I like to think that Liana and Michael are doing their part in that fight, and it's been a privilege to, to assist them. So um, here's what I, I thought we would do. I, I wanna kind of walk through some of these scenarios uh, with the two of you, and then ask you some questions um, that I have, that I still have. Um, and I'm hoping by the end of this time that you know, we and, and our, our you know, um, audience might have better, a little more clarity on what is, I think, becoming actually an increasingly confusing situation. There seems to be less and less clarity, not more as time goes on. Um, so yeah, like Michael said, we'll open it up at some point for questions and I look forward to hearing those too. So let's start with the, the really basic um, question, I think, as I said, the important and basic question. Liana, I'm gonna start with you. And I guess what I'd like to know is at this point in time, how should we define Ukrainian victory and how should we define Ukrainian defeat? Thanks so much, Justin. I will try to keep this short for the long versions. Feel free to read our articles. But I think at this point, we can define Ukrainian victory as limiting and reducing the scope of territory that is under Russian control. And not necessarily because territory was sort of the goal of this war, not because you know Russia was so fond of the Eastern Ukrainian landscape that they thought, well, this is, this is worth possessing, but limiting and reducing the territory under Russia control, Russian control equals the political existence and the political existence of Ukraine as an um, independent and basically non-Russian entity. So in very drastic words, every inch of Ukrainian territory that remains under Ukrainian control is somewhat of an antithesis to um, to Russian imperialism. Um, and uh, obviously in our article, we laid out that pushing Russia back to pre-invasion lines would be a goal, a goal of winning small, whereas we outlined that the goal of winning big would be more unrealistic. The second question, what would a Ukrainian defeat mean? Um, I mean, the very obvious answer is a Russian flag flying above the Ukrainian Rada, the Ukrainian parliament. But I think the answer will be a little bit less obvious. And the answer for a Ukrainian defeat would be at this moment, a country that is permanently partitioned and at a constant threat of being re-attacked, which would mean losing its statehood in a piecemeal and very slow way because not only militarily and economically, it's impossible to sustain this constant threat of being re-attacked, of being partitioned, but also because for a society, it is a shadow that is um, the permanent perspective of um, annihilation and of destruction. So I think the permanent partition of Ukraine would be a defeat for the West and for Ukraine. And can I just ask again about the, uh, the winning and small and winning big, um, you know, I just winning small, I got it. What, what, what was, how would you define winning big for Ukraine? Yeah, is we pushing define... is all the way back to the borders and exactly. winning small is, is what again? Winning small for us was pre-innovation line. So basically everything okay. before February 24 and winning so big Crimea, was- Crimea basically, yeah. Exactly, and winning big would yeah. mean Crimea and those parts of the East that were under Russian control since 2014, which yeah. from a moral and legal perspective would be obviously what we all want for Ukraine, but from a military and also political perspective to win big by military means is not only unrealistic, but potentially also very dangerous. Right. Okay, Michael, so same question for you, but from Moscow's point of view, um, or maybe not Moscow's point of view, but from, from the point of view of considering <laughs> Russian interests, what, uh, what would constitute a victory for Russia and what might constitute a defeat? So I think in terms of uh, a victory, I can see three possible dimensions and they all feel at the moment hypothetical, which is to say that they may exist in future scenarios, but I think Russia is pretty far from each of these uh, potential kinds of victories. Certainly, I mean, to sort of preface the comments as, by saying that the way in which Russia defined victory at the very beginning of the conflict, which was to say a rapid takeover of, of Ukraine, um, I don't think that's within Russia's reach for the, for the foreseeable future. So in that sense, that maximalist definition of, of, of victory is one that was probably destined to fail, but I think has already failed. But um, 
you know, some of this I think was implicit to what Liana just said uh, a moment ago. I think that um, Russia can bet on a kind of long-term strategy of just degrading Ukrainian nationhood and statehood. For that, you don't necessarily need to take big cities or take the capital city, but through the naval blockade, through incremental gains of territory, continued aerial bombardment uh, elsewhere, you kind of wear a country down. Uh, and if you think of the war, not in terms of months, but in terms of years, um, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's certainly a Russian strategy that has some potential for, uh, for success. I think victory in that scenario, you know, looks like a very, very chaotic kind of Ukrainian Syria, really, where it's not resolved or settled in the political sense. But uh, if Ukraine doesn't really belong to Russia, what Russia would do in that case is prevent it from belonging uh, to Europe or to the West being a kind of uh, dysfunctional nether zone that would function practically as a buffer zone for, uh, for Russia. I think another domain in which Russia contemplates victory, I think probably with some degree of overconfidence in Moscow is in the transatlantic domain. Uh, and so this would be political fissures, domestic problems with inflation or economics, or perhaps discontent with the war itself, so-called Ukraine fatigue, uh, and of course, it is a substantial challenge for the West or for the kind of coalition that's been involved in sanctions and military aid for Ukraine that it's you know 30 plus countries and that's not easy to sustain. So I think Russia sees opportunities there, but I think it may be um, you know sort of more hopeful from its point of view than uh, than the the situation merits. But that's certainly uh, you know something that is contemplated. Uh, in Mas Moscow, and then thirdly, in terms of, of, of victory, I think that there's a kind of global bet that Russia is making at the moment. Uh, and here, I think the question is simply a, an, an open one. Can Russia rewrite the rules uh, of international order in what it is doing in Ukraine? Can it make the case that sovereignty is very conditional and that so-called great powers have the right to determine their own rules or their own rules in their own uh, neighborhoods? Obviously, that has lots of meaning for China and for multiple other countries uh, in the world. And this is precisely what the US and I think Europe is trying to bet against. That this is not a project that's gonna succeed uh, as a project of international order. But I think for Russia, that's, um, that's very important. So the demonstration effect of the war in Ukraine uh, and it's something that brings us into a, a new era in which Moscow's way of thinking would be more globally um, prevalent or, or, or perhaps even uh, predominant. In terms of defeat, um, you know, I think uh, we'll very quickly go through four points. Uh, one I feel is already there, one element of defeat, and this is that Russia's political objectives in Ukraine seem not only impossible for Russia to reach, but the very war is making them harder and harder to reach. So the idea that Russia can exert any kind of non-coercive influence in Ukraine in the future for the next 30, 40 years, I think is off the table. Uh, and that right. means in a certain sense that Russia has lost Ukraine. Uh, maybe that was true already in 2014, but it's emphatically the case now. And so that has to be, you know, very uh, meaningful in the sense that Russia will not be able to align its military powers such as they are uh, with its political objectives. And that's, I would say, the folly of this war from uh, from a Russian point of view. Uh, secondarily, as, as Liana suggests, there are you know, various ways in which the Ukrainian military could hand Russia 100 percent defeat or 50 percent defeat or 25 percent defeat all of which would be very, very meaningful for Ukraine through counteroffensives and through pushing back Russian soldiers. Sort of what happened uh, in Kiev and, and Chernigov and, and Kharkiv um, over the last couple of weeks, if that could be writ large, you know, a sort of set of military gains uh, in the South and the East, that of course, even though Russia would still be standing and its military would still be in existence, would be a bitter defeat uh, for Russia. Uh, you know, I think, uh, thirdly, in the same way that Russia hopes for a global traction in terms of the war in Ukraine. This has not 100%, but has started to work against Russia. I think it has isolated itself. You know, public opinion in places like India, where the government has a certain position on Russia, I think has not become more pro-Russian because of the war. And you don't even have to go into public opinion in the United States or Germany or the UK or Central and Eastern Europe, where Russia has just, you know, sort of damaged itself, uh, perhaps uh, irreparably through the brutality of the war, the way in which it's been waged. Uh, and also the brutality of the whole concept of the war. Uh, I think that will be a great burden for Russia and could lead to a kind of uh, marginalization is too large of a word, but a sense of global obstacle that Russia will face uh, going forward. And finally, um, in terms of the global scene, I think the question is there with China 
as to whether China is, I don't think it's going to formally break from Russia, but when China decides that the war is not good for China, uh, you know, could it start to align in some ways with the United States? Could it start to seek a kind of shorter, you know, we think of, we worry about um, various figures in the US or in Europe trying to shorten the war. It's interesting to speculate about what would China do if it, if it, it was to shorten the war uh, for its own mm. interests, for its own economic reasons. Uh, and other reasons. But that certainly, if that were to come to pass, even if it would be very private, would I think be a very acute kind of defeat uh, for Russia. And to me, that's not science fiction. I think that there's a certain possibility that that could, could happen. So I'll end on that uh, on that Chinese note. Is there a variant, actually? I'm, this is a really interesting point about China. Is there a variant of that which involves a, a kind of defeat where, even if it's not an acute, like Beijing telling Moscow, cut it out, cut your losses, get out, but more simply this kind of vassal state status where you, you you know Russia becomes almost permanently the junior partner in this in this relationship. That would also I, I would imagine constitute a kind of defeat for Moscow, right? Leon, I don't know if you have 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 uh, thoughts on that. I, I'm sure I'm sure you uh, I'm sure you do. But I think that um, in some ways, what had subtly been worried about in Moscow before the war, I don't think it's exactly coming to pass. But uh, growing dependence on China, it, the impossibility of Russia now separating itself from that partnership with uh, with China. And of course, the more that Russia sells gas and oil and other commodities to China, there's also a kind of dependency that builds uh, in, in that regard. So all of that is strategically at the very least ambiguous, but perhaps really deleterious to, to Russia. Right. Uh, Leona, let me, let me, so I'm, I'm listening to you talk, both of you talk about this. And when I, in reading your pieces and hearing you talk about it now, you know, I'm struck that it's like, in both cases, victory, even the kind of limited victories that we're talking about seem really hard to imagine in a way, or just kind of, uh, I mean, you can kind of see a route to them, but they seem unlikely, they seem out of reach. And then listening to the defeat scenarios for both, they sound really bad, you know, like just really, really undesirable outcomes. So, and it, so as a, as a you know, as someone reading this stuff and, and watching these things happen, I, you know, I keep coming back to it. Well, okay, when you have a situation like that, just in your ordinary life, you know, anybody can relate when you're in a situation like that, there's pressure to make a deal, you know, to compromise, to negotiate, to figure out, all right, well, you know, I can't win. I don't want to lose. So how do I figure out how to do something in the middle? Um, it, we did this, one of your pieces was, it's funny now thinking about it, we titled it, I think, what if Russia cuts a deal or what if Russia cuts a deal? I, it, in fact, of course, it's, it's what if, we should have titled it, I think, what if Russia and Ukraine cut a deal, right? Because actually, it's not just a matter of whether Russia decides to, it wants to a, a deal. It's, Ukraine has to decide that too. And it's not clear actually that, so I would just love to hear you talk a little bit about, I think what is in some ways, or was for a long time, that the really big animating question, at least in New York was like, all right, what does a deal look like here? Who, what could this sides agree to? Maybe you could shed some light on that. Yeah, thank you. I think the fact that we titled it, what if Russia makes a deal was actually, I mean, a result of the situation at that time. And that's perhaps also one of right. the, um, yeah, one of what this title is about. It's a little bit, we always say like a historiography, a first attempt of drafting history of a war um, in weeks times, um, because at that point, the only way how a deal could be struck seemed that Russia would agree to it because Ukraine was so much weaker. And I think right. we have reached a turning point um, since since then, which is why this scenario doesn't seem to me entirely realistic at the moment, why I'm a little bit more pessimistic about it. I mean, perhaps just to, to say two thoughts, how we thought or how we came to this scenario, I think our idea was that there might be no clear ending to the war back then, and that, you know, the West should do better than the Minsk agreements and the uh, Minsk II agreements um, that was done by that. And from that point, we tried to think about, you know, what could be compromises that could be made. Zelensky was talking back then about, you know, um, NATO membership, uh, removing NATO membership as a goal in the Ukrainian constitution. The Ukrainian negotiation team in Istanbul also proposed to freeze Crimea, the status of Crimea for 15 years um, linked with uh, Western securities at that time. So there was actually negotiations ongoing and there was a possibility of being a deal reached which would still have been a deal very much on on russian terms because at that time russia was more powerful than ukraine was 
And what happened afterwards is firstly that the atrocities in Bucha and in the other cities around Kiev were, were discovered, which basically for Ukrainians made it clear that a deal which involves territory under Russian control is incredibly difficult because it means a potential scene of war crimes and that Ukraine was becoming militarily more powerful because they were able to push Russia out of, you know, of Kiev, of the surroundings, uh, Kharkiv. And that has led to a situation where at the moment it seems that any negotiations or any deal will be found on a battlefield, on the battlefield, which is <laughs> pretty frustrating, especially if the battlefield at the moment involves on the Ukrainian side, that's what we know, about 100 to 200 deaths of Ukrainian soldiers per day, which is incredible as a number. But I think the idea of a provisional peace that we had back then, I'm a little bit more pessimistic about this because from the Russian side, we see that Russia has no signs of learning. So there's no sort of realization, oh, something went wrong. We have to change our goals. We use the territory that we have as sort of negotiation bargaining chips. But to the contrary, it really is, you know, Putin is doubling down on the whole territory of a you know, whole, whole speech, you know, if Ukraine doesn't exist as a country. I'm the new Peter the Great. <laughs> um, and it's also incorporating the territory under control within Russia. So it is really an entirely imperial territory oriented approach from the Russian side with no signs for negotiations um, that can be taken serious um, and will lead to, to a lasting peace. And that's why I think at the moment, making a deal is um, very far away in the future and uh, not something to be optimistic about. Right, because given given those kind of maximalist imperial aims, why would he stop in Donbass, right? That's the logic. Absolutely, yeah. Right. So that, well then, okay, if then then that leads to this, I think what, what was our, our sort of final, our most recent and fifth, you know, entry in this was, uh, you know, what happens if the war doesn't end, if it, if, it, if it just kind of drags on, which, you know, in recent weeks has just started to seem more and more, um, likely to me as a kind of non-expert observer and what that would what that might mean michael can you can you walk us through you know what what that scenario looks like and what the ramifications of it are yeah no it's very easy to pick up here the thread uh, directly from uh, from from liana so going back and rereading the pieces there is and i think this was typical of, of many at the beginning in the early stages of the war a certain overestimation of russian military might uh, and you can see how the pieces, you know, in, in sequence kind of change in that regard. Uh, and also uh, the atrocities, the maximalist war aims, the excellence of, of, of Zelensky's leadership and of the Ukrainian military effort, all of that changes the, the equation. So of course it's poignant in a certain sense that the first entry in the series is what if Russia wins? Um, and, you know, now we've moved on to, I think a somewhat different uh, perspective, but you can also factor in and this is, speaks, I think, to the possibility of a long war, two other maybe modest miscalculations that were made in some of the essays or between the lines of some of the essays. I think that the sanctions, the assumption was that the sanctions would act pretty quickly, that they, they would be really devastating for Russia. I think that may well be true over the long term in terms of technology transfer, but Russian revenues when it comes to gas and oil uh, haven't been that bad. Uh, and, you know, certainly, you know, whatever this does to the Russian economy, their ability to sustain the war for a while financially, uh, that's very much within their means. And this is one thing that I think we really got wrong in the essays. There's one paragraph about the Russian people because they have all these connections to Ukraine and it's a neighbor responding in some sort of protest form. That did happen in the first week. There were these protests in Moscow and in Petersburg, a few other cities. But difficult as Russian public is to Russian public opinion is to read, there just hasn't been a kind of upswell of anti-war sentiment, and if anything, a kind of rough majority of Russians seem to support the war. So that too, if that's true, that will help Putin sustain uh, the war effort. So the the final point I would make in this regard, uh, and to me, is something that we've tried to deal with in each of these essays in a different in, in different form and fashion. Uh, is that this is not, although the Cold War analogies are helpful, this is to me, uh, and uh, you know, Liana, if you disagree, I would, would, would love to hear uh, your thinking about this, but it's really not like the beginning of the Cold War. The Cold War began with the exhaustion of militaries after the Second World War, 
And though there were lots of disagreements about how Europe was to be configured and lots of frustration on Truman's part, and frustration on Stalin's part, uh, there was a kind of rigidity uh, and frozenness to much of the Cold War conflict in Europe in the 1940s. And that did last uh, for decades with the exception perhaps of various crises about West Berlin. Uh, I think here, by contrast, there's not rigidity and uh, formality. In fact, nobody really knows where the lines of conflict are. And in my view, they extend around Belarus as much as they do uh, the territory of, uh, of Ukraine. We have Finland and Sweden joining NATO, which in, in its own way sort of changes some of the European uh, configurations. Uh, and it's the very unpredictability of that war, which is in the geographic center of Europe, that makes this perhaps unlike the First World War, unlike the Second World War, unlike the Cold War, uh, and I think it could smolder and go on for a very, very long time uh, because neither side really has an incentive uh, uh, to negotiate and to make concessions. Uh, but the potential for destabilization in various different directions is, I'm afraid, greater than I would assess for the, for the late 1940s. So it's Cold War-ish in terms of something that could have a lot of time uh, or could take a lot of time. But it's not Cold War-ish in the sense that it's it's probably closer to a hot war than a Cold War. Liana, do you want to jump in on that? I'm curious to hear your response to that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, perhaps just two thoughts. The reference to the to the Cold War, and I think that's an interesting one, also for our thinking about you know how long will Putin stay in power and how sustainable is his regime, because sort of looking superficially at the Cold War, we, you know, could look at Stalin and say, okay, well, I mean, he stayed in power until 53, until he died, despite all the atrocities that he has done, not only to his neighbors, but primarily to his own people, which sort of um, would counter some of the arguments also by Russian exiles that hope, you know, Putin can't sustain this, this, this will be impossible. But then on the other hand, I mean, Stalin and the ones who followed them and the Soviet Union stayed in power because it won the Second World War, because it continued, it was, was able to continue to draw legitimacy from this victory and to find a space for itself in the order after the Second World War uh, through, through the victory in this war. And I think this is something which is um, could perhaps make us a little bit more optimistic about you know, the question, will Putin and Putin two and three and all the successes that will come, will it take as long as from Stalin to Gorbachev <laughs> until we will see you know, some liberal change in Russia? Perhaps it will not take that long because 1945 is pretty long gone. And even if Putin tries to refer to that as one of the main legitimizing sources of his thinking, it is far away. And the other point um, that Michael mentioned, and, you know, everyone loves to cite, the, to quote this, you know, the unknown unknowns and the known unknowns. <laughs> but I think it's actually really still useful to think in this way. And I think one of the unknown unknowns that we might still have is something which is, you know, akin to the MH17 scenario in 2014 that was when Ukrainian separatists um, killed uh, over 200 passengers of you know, a Dutch plane, Malaysian airplane over Eastern Ukraine. And this is something, this is one of these unknown unknowns that can still happen in this war. So we had, we had this war, but we didn't have you know, an issue that just came unex completely unexpectedly out, out of, of nowhere, the, yeah. Exactly. Right. And I think these these instances have the potential to change <laughs> dramatically our thinking right. about scenarios. So in case right. we, have we can think things look sort of frozen and they're, you know, we're in this exactly. stasis now and it's a stalemate. And then suddenly, yeah, uh, somebody shoots a planet out of the sky and the whole thing changes. Yeah. So uh, one of the reasons yeah. where we might have to continue, if we have to continue the series, it will be to one of those right. unknown unknowns. Right, right. Yeah, you know, it's interesting, this question about um, about uh, the kind of ideological, Michael, just hearing you talk about this, you know, the, the, the Cold War um, uh, parallel here. And I, I wonder whether, I mean, I think a lot of lay people at least like look at the Cold War and see it as sort of, um, ultimately this was a test of two different systems, right? I mean, this is sort of the way it was, it was you know, um, understood at the time, I think, right, was that, and, and, and we kind of code the way the Cold War resolved itself as proof that, you know, liberal democracy or, you know, liberal capitalist societies were able to kind of outlast um, this sclerotic Soviet style system. And I guess what's been sort of interesting to me in this um, 
in this war has simply been that it's we sort of have the same question, but without the clear or obvious ideological element. And people kind of don't talk about it that way, right? In the sense that, and, and with the sanctions, you talk about the sanctions, it seems to me when I look at what's happening, it's like, well, Putin seems to feel that he can bear his system, he his political regime and his system, to the extent that he has a system, can survive any kind of grievances or griping that the public has about, you know, the fact that their lives have been made worse by his his imperialistic adventure and and thinking, oh, you know, yeah, OK, NATO and the, the West, I might have been I might have misread it a little bit. There was more unity there than I thought, at least amongst the governments and the elites. But how much unity is there between the publics and the elites on these terms, right, between governments and the publics? And I think when I look around and gas prices are going up and, you know, I guess my feeling is I wonder whether today, as much I hate to say this, the fragility of our uh, system with, with kind of, you know, strong, hot politics and populist movements. And it wouldn't it seems to me it wouldn't take much. That, that, that you know, the, 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 the political price that Biden or other European leaders might pay, even for what we understand objectively are not huge costs, but that people feel really strongly about, like, I don't want to pay more at the pump because of Ukraine. It just seems to me that we're heading now into this phase of the conflict where those questions are going to be really acute. I wonder what you two think about that. So, you know, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful question. I mean, of course, the historian in me would want to go back not just to 1989 and to the moment of, of Western victory in the Cold War, but to the 1970s when many people felt that the momentum was on the Soviet side and you know Vietnam had sort of devastated the United States internally and the energy crisis. And uh, there's a, a famous book on the Cold War in the 1970s when things were going our way, I think by a former uh, KGB operative and the sense that also the global South was sort of orienting itself more toward the Soviet Union than toward uh, Europe and the United States. So the Cold War had its own, you know, sort of many ebbs and flows. Uh, and that might be a little bit of a source of comfort in the, uh, in the present mm -hmm. moment. But uh, just to break down your question to into two points, I think you're entirely right about Putin that this is his view. He doesn't see Russia, I'm sure, as a dictatorship, but he's certainly aware that there's no way in which party politics or elections can intrude uh, on his foreign policy. So he can sort of stick with it to the degree that he can remain in office, and that degree is not uh, immediately in question. I think he also thinks, not an uncommon Russian conviction, that Russians are tougher than Europeans, tougher than Americans. Uh, they can deal with economic hardship better. Uh, they have more patience, that they'll sort of rally around the flag more. Whether that's true or not, I have no idea, but I think that that is a conviction uh, in, uh, uh, in, the, in the Kremlin. Uh, and then finally, and this point has been made, you know, sort of since 2014 has been a debating point that Russians care more about Ukraine uh, than many people on the other side of the conflict do. Again, I don't think there's a metric for understanding that, but um, that's something that Putin, I think, is, uh, is banking on. Um, the problems, I think, on our side are pretty obvious in terms of polarization, maybe short attention span, possibility of getting distracted. It's not as if Ukraine is the only challenge or difficult that, difficulty that Europe and the U.S. face. There are issues in Asia and uh, in the Middle East and elsewhere, and there's always domestic politics, but I'll just sort of conclude on a somewhat more optimistic note, because I think that this point gets sometimes buried in terms of discussions of the systemic competition that you're asking about, Justin. I think the reason that Zelensky could emerge as such an excellent leader is not because he was born as Winston Churchill. He was, you know, somebody who came from the world of entertainment, and I don't think he was a great president of Ukraine until the war began. He was, he was fine, but he was not extraordinary. But the reason that he could do what he did is that he won an election in 2019. And mm -hmm. Petro Poroshenko, who's also not an angel, um, presided over a peaceful transition of power. And that created in Ukraine a real legitimacy. Uh, you know, we voted for the man who reflects our principles, our values. You know, this is our country. Uh, and I think in the absence of that, if you just had a kind of permanent oligarch in Ukraine, I'm not sure you would get that kind of, of, of leadership. And, you can mirror that in the sense that the support for Ukraine is yes, about a country that's been very unjustly attacked uh, and is suffering very, very unfairly, that's for sure. But there is a sense in which the pluralism of Ukraine, the fact that it has multiple political parties, that its leader is genuinely a Democrat, I think that that matters enormously for the kind of support that Ukraine uh, has gotten. So does that guarantee victory? Uh, by no means, but uh, right. is sort of systemic strength of, 
Europe, the US, like minor countries, is that uh, formidable in its own right? I would say that I would say that it is. Interesting. What do you think, Liana? That's a, I, you, the way I the way I almost think of what you're saying, Michael, is the is the hope versus fear uh, paradigm, right? You know what what's going to be stronger, the kind of Ukrainian hope and belief in their in, in, in those values, or the kind of fear that that Russians uh, feel, you know, about about the the consequences for getting out of line there. What do you think, Liana? Yeah, I mean, just perhaps to add two points, I think one of the risks, which is sort of adding to this kind of fatigue sometimes in Western societies, one of the gaps and shortfalls of the transatlantic approach is sort of the strategic ambiguity about the end game. I mean, this makes the public nervous. <laughs> the public wants to hear right. what's the aim, how long are we going to deliver weapons, and when will we stop? Right? And as long as there's no right. answer to that, it does not only increase divisions within Europeans, with you know France and Germany being like, well, we don't say that Ukraine should win. We could also imagine other scenarios, negotiated scenarios, and um, the Poles and then and, and, and the Baltics saying, well, Ukraine needs to win because this is existential for us. And then we have the US side, which is a little bit you know, stronger than Germany and France are, but also, so I think this strategic ambiguity is adding to some sort of, yeah, impatience within the public, which wants clear answers and has, um, yeah, has a strong feeling that, that this would help to explain the world rather than thinking about, as Michael said, about a um, Ukraine-Syria scenario. And the second point is, and I'm still thinking about this, <laughs> we've discussed this per, per email, Michael, to what extent you know, the China factor now plays a role in comparison to the Cold War. I mean, to some extent, mm -hmm. the Cold War was also trilateral. You mentioned this, Michael, that, you know, we also had China back then. But the question that I haven't answered for myself is, do we have a stronger autocratic camp right now than we had in the Cold War? Um, because we need to count Russia and China together, basically. I mean, China is more and more obvious in the um, in their statements when it comes to, to the war and to siding with Russia. So does this make it more difficult than in the Cold War because now the autocratic camp might be bigger or becoming bigger in terms of GDP, in terms of support than the democratic camp? Not answered yet, but <laughs> I think that's a question to, to for the future. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna ask one last question before we, 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 we go to the, the question if you don't mind. And this is like a, a it's a, it's a question I've had that I've asked a lot of people and I, 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 there's not a good answer to it maybe, but I think it's worth thinking about. I'd love to hear you both think about it. Um, you mentioned, Liana, the public's kind of frustration or at least you know, American European fr uh, public's frustration about you know, when will this end? Show me how this ends or tell me how this ends. That's the famous David Petraeus line right about Iraq and the kind of questions about what's the strategy here. Um, I, I the, related to that is my uncertainty with where the line is in terms of the participation of outside countries, right? So if the United States and European capitals send javelins and tanks and guns and missiles and anti-aircraft and who knows what else is gonna come and heavy artillery, I mean, we basically, if the Western powers arm Ukraine almost entirely, and by the way, train Ukrainian forces, and but um, how exactly? Why is that? Not, what's the difference between that and simply sending, you know, an American service member or a, you know, uh, a, 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 a service member from a NATO place? I just, I, I, I can't. And and how do we expect? Like, I can't quite figure that out. And I wonder then, well, how do we expect the Russians? to figure that out or the Ukrainians, you know, to know like where the lines, it seemed to me, it seems to me, and again, I'd really love to know about the Cold War here where the lines seemed a little clearer in the Cold War, but maybe that's not true. I mean, maybe maybe that that uncertainty or ambiguity was there as well with all the proxy fighting, but, but do, is this something that either of you think about that I, I just worry that it's so unclear and there's so little articulation about this and people just brush right past it. It's sort of like, well, of course, we're not directly involved in the war in Ukraine. There's no American boot on the ground. It's like, right, but you know, wh why does that make such a big difference? What do you, what do you think? Either of you want to jump in on that? I'd be, I'd, I'd love to know what you think about. Well, I'll, I'll try an optimistic view. Perhaps you want to okay. try to take the pessimistic view, Michael. From my perception, these lines are sort of invisibly negotiated throughout the war, especially between you, the, the United States and Russia. And I think we see a lot of messaging, you know, 
the op-ed um, by Joe Biden. I mean, it was obviously mm-hmm. messaging not only towards the transatlantic community, but it was also clear messaging towards Moscow in times when there's no direct channel to Moscow. Which is where he said it, he, there was this sort of inside Ukraine, right? Like that was the, we, we'll, we'll give them the ability to do Ex- these things inside Ukraine. That was the message, right? As opposed to in Russia. Exactly. And also, you know, yeah. there will be no, the aim is not regime change in Moscow. So he tried to set very clear lines. And that's, I mean, the whole title about what, you know, America wants to do and what America will not do. And the same point, you know, about weapon deliveries by NATO, what kind of weapon deliveries, deliveries accepted or not. Obviously, we see all the time Russian threats, but some of these threats are not acted upon, which then means that this is the new line, which is sort of acceptable. Um, So I think there's this constant negotiation and also sort of compared to the Cold War, we also had proxy wars, you know, where there was fighting between the United States and Russia. What is concerning to me is that these nuclear threats um, that, you know, Putin makes and the fact that nuclear threats have become sort of from the Russian side, an acceptable means rather than just being an instrument of deterrence. I mean, in the Cold War, it was, well, this is about deterrence. If you attack us, we attack you, we're all dead. And now it's, if you impose sanctions on us, we might consider throwing a nuclear bomb. And I think that's something which has dramatically changed. And where I wonder if that's not something which makes also China, or should make China and other actors very nervous. nervous because this yeah. is completely destabilizes the rules of the, of the nuclear order. So that's something where I'm more concerned about, you know, what will uh, Moscow's loose talk and nuclear sable wetting mean for the future, whereas on the conventional, the conventional field, it seems to me that there was some invisible negotiation, implicit mm-hmm. negotiation going on through, through all the actions that we take or do not take. Yeah, no, I would love to, uh, to jump in. I can't play the pessimistic foil entirely uh, to what you say uh, uh, Liana would just make a, a, a couple of points. I mean, of course, the Cold War should never be uh, romanticized. It was enormously dangerous at most turns, and you had, you know, very, very substantial Chinese and, and Soviet support to the North Vietnamese in ways that were very, very frustrating on the U.S. side. And any number of pro- proxy conflicts in which the U.S. was, you know, sort of similarly involved. I mean, you have the famous phrase from the Cold War, Nikita Khrushchev, "We will bury you," which, which something lingering in my mind about a mistranslation or something of this, some sort of scandal about how the, how the words came into the English language, but nevertheless was interpreted at the time as a nuclear threat. So even though there was a lot more discipline on the Soviet side than Putin is showing, uh, sometimes that rhetoric could, uh, could spill over. Of course, you have the Cuban Missile Crisis, which um, you know, could have gone many different ways and the Able Archer, uh, you know, sort of nuclear crisis of the early uh, early 1980s. So we live in a nuclear age and it's been dangerous from uh, the beginning, but there does seem to be um, a, a difference at the moment. I mean, if you think back to um, US support for the Mujahideen in Afghanistan, the sort of Charlie Wilson's war um, images that come to mind of that, there was always that plausible deniability, right? You're sending weapons, but the weapons are not uh, made in the US. There are other kinds of weapons. And so if there's a kind of scandal, um, you can distance yourself from it now. There have been various moments when some US government officials have sort of bragged about the kind of military support uh, and intelligence support that they're giving to Ukraine and apparently President Biden got, uh, got angry about that. But you know, we've sort of gone in almost the opposite direction from plausible deniability to demonstrations uh, of how mm. much uh, military aid is flowing directly from the US and other countries uh, into, uh, into Ukraine. I agree entirely with Liana about the invisible negotiations that are going on. And I think that they're also happening uh, on the Russian side so far. Uh, it's not as if Russia has started to bomb military convoys in Poland or do something that provocative. Right. Held themselves back in certain cases uh, that may not continue forever, but that's uh, valid up until now. Where I have lots of worries, and now I start to see a new piece taking shape along the lines that Liana, you know, getting a live pitch here, Justin, in terms of a- <laughs> Okay, <laughs> go, go ahead, yeah, go but, but, Behind uh, the scenes. <laughs> what didn't exist during the Cold War, of course, was social media. And so you had two American soldiers, apparently, or two Americans who were fighting on the Ukrainian side who've just been captured uh, uh, by the Russian army. I don't think that that's going to, you know, dramatically turn the course of the uh, of the of the war. But I think social media has the potential to inflame on the basis of accurate or inaccurate or invented information uh, in ways that weren't. You know, policymakers didn't have to worry about that during the uh, the Cold War. And I think that's one of the good reasons. Although I agree with you, Justin, it's sort of like hard to know. If you're sending 
you know, anti-ship missiles, but you're not sending troops, what's really the difference in the end? But the difference may be that if you had 100 US troops who got killed uh, in an era of social media where it's very quick to, for emotions can, can get inflamed very quickly, right. that you might prevent that scenario from developing in the first place. But I think that's one of the ways in which the rules could get chaotically renegotiated. We should probably be ready for that uh, in, in terms of what we're anticipating. Okay, well, <laughs> that's an alarming, an alarming note in some ways on which to, 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 to transition to the next phase of this uh, conversation. Uh, Michael, I'd love, to, I'd love to hear some of the questions that, uh, that people have posed and, and uh, maybe we can take a look at the uh, Q&A here. Speaking and of our can, uh, let us know. Well, let me let me ask for questions. They have not uh, yet arrived, uh, and if they okay. don't, we can just sustain the sustain the conversation ourselves. But the floor is very much open for anybody who wishes to submit a question through uh, the Q and A function. So I'll just sort of keep my eye on that. But Great. I think that the, a few other the, questions in your quiver, right? Yeah, I do, and and I, I I'll get to those now. Um, I guess this is a this is a simple basic question I'd like to ask a lot of people, and I'd love to hear what you guys think about this or what your responses are. I know I've learned. I think I've learned a lot since the war started, or learned a lot. Like I've, there's been a lot new, a more information. I don't know that I've learned how to understand things. But I don't think I understand things any better than I did. But I've learned things I didn't know, and I've been surprised. I'm curious. What do you? We, and some of this you've already talked about, but maybe some of these points we haven't got. What have you two learned? What do, What do you know now? that you didn't know, you know, on February 23rd? I mean, perhaps to start with two points, I think my first learning was how difficult it is <laughs> to accept worst case scenarios. <laughs> and this is another point of behind the scenes, if I may say this, Michael, sort of when we first started brainstorming about, you know, thinking through what a Russian victory would mean, we were, you know, even skeptical ourselves. We were like, oh my, is this, you know, too much defeatism, defeatism to put this out, you know, the war hasn't even started, and we sort of judging too far, too far ahead. But then it turned out that actually, you know, thinking this through um, was very helpful to many people who were afraid of doing it themselves. I mean, that's at least a, feed, a lot of feedback that I got, especially from Europe, that this scenario scared so many people <laughs> that they were then sort of more willing to think through, through potential actions if this happens. And I think this was the case with the pandemic at some point, you know, how difficult it is to accept that worst case scenarios can become true. And then again, how quickly we get used to it. I mean, now the war, three months, it's at least here in Europe, it's not, you know, in the public, it's, it's present in the public as it has been, as it has been before. And the second um, lesson learned, or what has surprised me is um, to what extent wars of the 21st century, at least so far in the first, first quarter of the 21st century, are still wars of the 20th century, sort of in the way that they are fought. And I mean, this has obviously to do with Russia and Ukraine, because there's a lot of, you know, Soviet um, military equipment and so on. But this is one a big land war as in the 20th century. And, you know, working beforehand on, you know, all kinds of hybrid scenarios, AI and so on, it really shows, and despite all the cyber elements that we have, that, you know, the crucial part is still about tanks and uh, how many tanks you have and how much land mass you can, you can win through these tanks. And um, that's for Europe really a throwback to, to old times. Plus a challenge, yeah, that's a great point. What about you, Michael? So, you know, the degree of Western support, going back to what we were speaking about uh, a moment ago, and there's often a lot of frustration with the support that's not given. Uh, that's very understandable, but I think it's important to recognize where we, given where we were say, four or five months ago, the amount of support has been um, more than I would have expected, and I would include also intelligence sharing uh, in uh, in the mix. And also, and this is a larger topic, but uh, the manner of the intelligence sharing, both targeting and intelligence that have been given from the U.S. and other countries to Ukraine, but also prior to the war itself, the way in which intelligence uh, was deployed, and I think really made a big difference in terms of the initial Russian failures within the first week, Hostomel Airport. Uh, Etc. I think um, that's not something I would have predicted before the war uh, started. Started, and it's been very um, uh, interesting to uh, observe the Ukrainian military performance. This is, you know, something that uh, has been very widely commented on. So I won't belabor the uh, the point, but um, you know, it's not what I would have uh, predicted before the war for a couple of reasons. 
uh, and has been a very welcome surprise in the course of the war itself. And perhaps this will reveal my own naivete in saying it, but uh, uh, you know, the truth above all, uh, I've been surprised by the brutality of the, uh, the scope of the war, first and foremost, but also the brutality uh, of the invasion. Now, naive because you know, Russia showed great brutality in the wars against Chechnya, uh, it showed great brutality in, in Syria. So it's not that the Russian army is capable of brutality, um, but given that Russia does have these political objectives, or I think it does, uh, not only is it counterproductive, but it's just shocking to me to put it, sort of conclude on this point, sort of a human observation, uh, these countries are neighbors. And right. the, the brutality just surprises me uh, in, uh, in, uh, in that sense. I don't have a good way of, of, of explaining it, there must be a must be a way to explain it, but uh, you know. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I, it, I I know what you're getting at. I've been surprised by that too, in the sense that you, I've thought, well, in the Chechnya and Syria situations, you have sort of ethnic others, right? It's it's Syria obviously is far away, Chechnya not so much, but these are this, these were ethnically religiously distinct people. You could you can see it historically, you know, leaders have been able to mobilize people against others that that you know but the the whole what i agree with you that this was surprising to me as well because part of putin's pitch right was that the ukrainians are our family right that there are they are a part of the russian world and so it, that sits so uneasily with the kind of uh treatment i guess maybe i i don't know i mean i the yeah i don't know i don't know what that means i guess it doesn't what what is what is the permission structure that is allowing um, uh, Russian forces to inflict these kinds of atrocities, um, you know, or if it's maybe not a permission structure, but an incentive structure even, right? I mean, I, who knows? That will be something that I think uh, tribunals will likely one day uh, be delving into. I mean, if, if this, if, uh, maybe hopefully uh, will one day delve into. Um, let, me, let me ask a, a, a question also about um, the rest of the world. You, you both alluded to this in some of your comments about the uh, maybe it would be the best way to put it is the limits of um, global, you know, coordination against Russia. Um, not you know, obviously China is a, maybe a special case, but you mentioned India. Um, obviously, you know, Brazil, South Africa, lots of other large countries where that are kind of sitting on the fence in some ways. Um, I'd I'd love to hear your thoughts about that, and I guess very specifically, you know, I wonder whether what we're seeing. And maybe this is naive on my part, but when I think about how the, um, uh, the, the, the fight against Russia is framed or the fight for Ukraine is framed, there, there, there are kind of two versions of that. There's, this is a fight for uh, sovereignty. There's a element of kind of nationalism, right? And, and that the Ukrainian nation, it, it, the nation state needs to be defended. Um, and that those are the principles that this is a fight about. And then on the other side, there's this different argument, which is about democracies versus autocracies. And I can't help but thinking that those are a little bit conflicting messages. And I just wonder about how, if you're trying to expand the, um, if you're Joe Biden or you're, you know, um, uh, Olaf Schultz or you're, you know, Boris Johnson, <laughs> you know, and you're, you're, you're trying to figure out how do we, how do we get, you know, India on board? How do we, we get uh, Brazil on board. I should have maybe said Macron and not Johnson. Um, <laughs> but you know, uh, what what is, is is there? Did this frame? Does this really matter? Really, like, do, do you think that that matters, or is that kind of a thing that that people like us kind of obsess about? But that policymakers, it's like, look, this is just about raw material interests. I don't care how you frame it. You know, our interests are going to be dictated here in India. We're, our interests are dictated by the fact that we buy all these arms from Russia. You know, in Brazil, we need the energy, whatever it is. What do you think? Do those frames actually matter? I mean, perhaps just a quick additional thought about the Ukrainian Brotherhood question, the brutality that you just mentioned, because I think that's important to, to know that the discourse in Russia on that has also significantly changed. I mean, at the beginning, oh, it really? was about in the defense. Oh, really? In what way? How is that? Yeah. It was at the beginning about sort of the defense of Eastern Ukrainians, then what was about Nazis in Ukraine that you should eliminate. And now we see that Dmitry Medvedev, the former president, um, who really has become you know, tries to position himself as the super hog in, in, in Moscow, that he now sort of includes the entire Ukrainian population as an enemy, you know, in his in his posts, in his writings. And we do, I mean, obviously this, this leads to 
you know reducing levels of you know not be of, of um of uh, hesitating before applying brutality if uh, the whole notion of Ukrainians being brothers is now changed to Ukrainians are, are the enemies and need to be uh, defeated. Um, and that, I think, is really concerning how quickly this brother narrative can change into it's not only the Nazis, but now it's all, all Ukrainians. And all of them, yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's really concerning and worrisome. Um, but I think the second question sort of about the rest of the world, I think it's it's incredibly interesting. I mean, first of all, I always notice how much sort of our own mistakes come back haunting us. I mean, no discussion with Chinese representatives who don't mention the Iraq war, for instance. Um, and of course, one can say, well, this is what about autism and so on. That's sort of an easy response to that. But it, it, it makes sort of um, makes it easier for some countries to put our responses into question. I think from a policy perspective, it's very obvious that this autocracy democracy divide makes it more difficult to have broad coalitions. So it's easier to have, for instance, in the UN General Assembly to convince countries that, you know, you don't want to be attacked by your neighbor, so you should condemn this. This is not how we want to live together, rather than to do the autocracy democracy divide. For our internal transatlantic societies, I think it matters as an argument. I would not say that it matters so much from Moscow's perspective. There's always this narrative that Moscow launched this war because it didn't want uh, an increasingly successful democratic Ukraine. I think Moscow never perceived Ukraine as democratic or successful. Right. They had no idea about what was going on in Ukraine. Their, their expertise and intelligence about Ukraine was you know, completely outdated also because no one of the, of the top leadership was traveling to Ukraine in the, in the, in the yeah. last eight years. Um, so I think you need to look at the different areas where this argument about values makes sense. It makes sense for the transatlantic community, um, but it does not make sense for the global, for sort of the, the wider um, the wider global community. And I'm always surprised how, you know, Russian and Chinese influence in other countries, how strong that is. I mean, if we look at Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, weapons exports, I mean, Russia is supports uh, supplies 30 percent of weapons to um to to countries in africa and i'm not decided perhaps michael is <laughs> about whether this is really from those countries a question about anti-westernism you know combined with colonial legacies or whether mm. this is just pure interests um i tend to switch between both arguments um yes perhaps you have an answer michael I don't have, have a good answer to that. I mean, I think that, um, you know, the first simple point I would make is let's acknowledge how big the coalition is. Uh, it's not just a European or transatlantic coalition. It does include Australia, New Zealand, you know, Singapore, Japan, South Korea. And so it is a global co coalition in terms of economic sanctions and different kinds of support that are going to Ukraine. And that's a huge achievement of the Biden administration and others who are sort of working toward that uh, toward that goal. So it's a simple point, but I wouldn't want to lose uh, the side of it. In terms of the reaction of the non-like-minded countries, if you could put it that way, I mean, of course, we've spoken about the Cold War, the non-aligned states were an important dynamic in the Cold War. Some of that is, uh, it's, it's sort of repeating itself. India you know, was not aligned during the Cold War, and it's sort of uh, in that space uh, at the moment. I think it's not just the Iraq War and mistakes and anti-Westernism, uh, you know, we have to be sort of candid. You know, there's been a war in Libya for many, many years. There's been a war in Syria. Right. Many. There's an ongoing war in, in Yemen, uh, of which the U.S. is sort of a somewhat distant uh, part. There's been a kind of civil war in Ethiopia. Uh, and the level of public outrage about these wars in the United States and Europe has been pretty small. Uh, yes. over the last uh, five to 10 years. So you could almost turn the question around and say, why is it that there's not more concern about these conflicts? Uh, and that I think just gets you to the insight that there's a kind of regionalism uh, at work. And you know, the reason that many Europeans are upset about the war in Ukraine is that it's close at hand. And there's nothing wrong That's with right. that, but yeah. that will mean that there'll be a similar dynamic at work in Brazil or, uh, or in Egypt or you know, sort of sure. uh, other countries. So that just, I think is worth, uh, is, is worth acknowledging. And then you can put interests, you know, cheap gas and energy uh, that you would get if you're not part of the sanctions regime and that sort of stuff also also plays a right. role. Now, Justin, we have, I think, five questions that have come in. Great. So 
I hope, Justin, that you would feel free to jump in and answer uh, these questions together with the, uh, with the two of us. So we'll just sort of keep on uh, with the spirit of our conversation. Uh, and I will go to the first question from Marshall Hopkins. Please excuse me if I mangle anybody's name. I'm wondering, did the speaker see the lack of direct appeals to the Russian public separate from Putin in the style of Arnold Schwarzenegger's YouTube video as a missed diplomatic opportunity? Liana or Justin, would you want to jump in on the sort of public diplomacy question? You want to go first, Justin? Yeah, well, I'll, my response is funny. I've forgotten about that Schwarzenegger YouTube video, and it was very interesting. I remember watching it, and I'm not a fan of Arnold, um, <laughs> neither as a as a as an actor or quite frankly as an american political um you know i mean i i think it's a it's a mix it's a mixed bag there to, to say the least however i watched that and i thought this is good like this is i mean i don't know i thought it was it was direct it was, it was a little too long um and it's interesting marshall that you raised this because um i haven't seen a lot of stuff like that more importantly, putting aside people like Schwarzenegger, I haven't really heard Biden, and I don't know much actually on the European leaders, I don't know, but as an American and watching American president, I haven't really heard President Biden talk directly to the Russian people very much. And I know, I'm sure that's the result of a, of a calculation. I mean, that there's, there's limited gains there. Maybe they're not going to hear it anyway. What's the point? Um, other presidents have been criticized, I think, when I remember Obama had an address to the Iranian people that that you know his political opponents made hay of, um, but yeah, I I it does seem notable that there's there there hasn't been a, a an obvious or visible or public uh, public diplomacy effort um, to kind of try to break through um, all the the barriers that 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 Russian state uh, has thrown up, um, at least that we've seen. So I don't know. What, what do you think, Liana? Yeah, I think it's interesting. It's a really interesting question because obviously you need figures that have credibility in Russia. I think it's incredibly yeah. funny that Arnold Schwarzenegger, the strong man, is the one who, who might have this kind of credibility. So you need sort of these, you would need sort of these popular voices that are not yet discredited and I was just in my head thinking about modern talking I don't know if you remember this band it was very popular in Europe it's like a German singer um, terrible songs cherry cherry lady and so on but they were played throughout the whole Soviet Union you could travel to Kazakhstan and they would play modern talking um, so perhaps um, they would be they could do a similar kind of um, the, the question is were message. they a CIA operation <laughs> were they were they funded right? Because this is well, no. This the, the the other answer to the question here is winds of change. I don't know if you if any of you have listened to this terrific podcast that Patrick Radden Keefe did called Winds of Change, which is all about this question during the Cold War of you know um, uh, this song Winds of Change by the Scorpions and this question about to what extent they were it was related to you know a, an actual official effort to change Russian minds. But yeah, there had no winds of change, no no modern talking. Maybe yeah, maybe maybe they... we, what's and what's what's ironic about this, by the way, is that. You'd think actually in our globalized 21st century, um, all, like BTS, South Korean band is the biggest band in, in the world. You know, every you would think that there would be figures that spoke across these borders, but I'm actually not aware of any. You know, it would be really hard if you were casting around it. Who, who are the Scorpions today? I, I, ha I have no idea actually who would have that credibility. And that's kind of weird. I think one some actors that have credibility within Russia are incredibly important. So I think there have been, you know, these um, hip hoppers and rappers in Russia, which have been um, Oxymoron, for instance, which are incredibly popular right. and have huge uh, channels and connections um, to to especially the younger generation of Russians. So perhaps these actors are sort of inside Russia, especially from the cultural scene, are even more important. Um, Much more, yeah. than, mm -hmm. than than foreign actors. I think there's also a psychological difference between now and the Cold War that's working to our detriment. I think there was the feeling in the Cold War that it was an artificial thing, the Soviet Union, and that you could create this space between, say, Russians in the Soviet Union through popular culture, and you know whether it's the Beatles or you know, sort of Duke Ellington or others, uh, in, in, uh, Country Joe and the Fish, and uh, um, Billy Joel, the sort of famous uh, pop culture events of the 70s and 80s. Uh, and that you could sort of westernize public opinion through popular culture. I think now 
the assumption, rightly or wrongly, is sort of that Russia is more Russian. Uh, there isn't that space. Um, you, know, you can't really sort of pry Russians loose with popular culture to which they already have access. Uh, global popular culture, you can't sort of pry them loose from their convictions. And I don't know, it's, it feels to me like there's sort of more pessimism in that regard. Maybe I'm reading into things, but, uh, or maybe there's just the missing optimism that pop culture can, can play that role. But it's an excellent question because I think that there's unrealized potential. There's a related question from a friend of Monterey, uh, Kirill Shamiev asks, is it possible to maintain some sort of interaction with Russian elites? Russia is a pariah now, but are the elites? If so, are all elites? Or is there some distinction we can develop? For example, Patrushev and Nabiulina both serve the regime, but obviously with different roles in the war against Ukraine. I mean, I can try a first <laughs> take. Um, I think we need a deeper analysis now after the war about Russian elites and their role, because what was surprising to me was how surprising it was to the Russia Watchers community when we had this meeting with Putin and his Security Council, um, where you know it was very clear that you know he's he's the top and he decides and he forces everyone to adopt his position. And before we had for a long time still the perception, you know, that there are hawks and doves within the lead, and that Putin sort of tries to balance these elites. So I was surprised. Either I mean it might have changed very quickly, or we might have overlooked how centralized the Russian elite has become and how, you know, top down the, the power vertical that was there from the beginning has, has really become, I mean, even that, you know, um, in, uh, the leaders of uh, intelligence services have, have little room for, for maneuver, although Nawishkin was obviously not the strong in the strongest position beforehand already. Um, I wonder how, I perhaps the, my, my question would be the other way around, would these people be willing and be allowed to talk to Western elites. Those who actually have power, wouldn't this be seen as kind of, you know, treason? Um, or would they be sent only with, you know, a very clear message? So I think the problem is you only have these few that really have power at the moment. And since they are so closely around the president, I wonder whether they are you know, meant to talk to the West or rather meant to be very close to Putin and not to have any interaction with the West. That's my short take. I think I might be even more stark uh, than Liana was in her, in her answer. I think if you're willing to defect from the Russian government, that's happened at times during the Cold War, which is to say to sort of leave and go over to the other side. Um, and, you know, you've seen this with, with a couple of figures, um, uh, who have, uh, have gone sort of into the emigration since the beginning of the war, but it's a pretty modest phenomenon. But unless that were to happen, I don't think that any dialogue is possible on the premise, probably correct, that Putin is sort of the ultimate decision maker. Uh, so unless you can change his mind, the policy is not going to change. And I wonder if there is, and I haven't heard this articulated, but I wonder if there's in the sense that Nabiulina and the sort of more competent technocrats are part of the problem because they're helping keep the Russian economy afloat uh, and by keeping the Russian economy afloat and sort of keeping the Russian war machine in operation. So, you know, if you're not against the war, you're part of the problem. It's sort of impossible to be against the war in the Russian government. So unless there's a fundamental shift, uh, I don't think there's too much appetite to engage Russian political elites. But it's, it's an excellent question and it's worth really pondering and thinking about because you wouldn't want to be too stark or too categorical in answering it. Justin, you have any thoughts about engaging Russian elites? It's beyond my my can. I'm sorry. I, I I wish I wish I knew something more about it so that I could suggest how it could happen because I think it would be great. Okay, so this is a question from Julia Pitch. Uh, as a consequence of the war, the U.S. is having to deal now with not very pretty regimes. Let's say to secure a diversity of sources for fuel. Would you share your thoughts on the effect this may have on the country's standing on human rights? Very good question. I yeah, can so, give it, yeah, go ahead, Leanna. Yeah, Justin. No, 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 please, please. <laughs> I mean, just a quick take from from Germany because this is something which you know, for Germany as a country which has a tendency towards moralizing things. Let me say, it, put put it this way, uh, it was a big part of the debate that um, our minister of the economy Habeck, who is also a green politician, uh, traveled to Qatar to um, get uh, uh, 
yeah, in, uh, Qatarian gas in, uh, instead of Russian gas. Um, but what was interesting, and I'm just telling this as an anecdote without a final answer, what is interesting is that he communicated this very openly. So he even did like a video where he spoke very openly about the contradictions this is and how difficult it is for a green politician like him to do so, but that the aim of reducing dependency from Russia at the moment and the effect on the war is more important than that. Um, I think it's an interesting strategy of approaching these questions which are morally sort of um, where you are forced perhaps by your publics, you know, to put it black or white to actually be open about the contradictions that foreign policy has in many regards. I mean, there's just no way of um, dealing with democracies. That that just doesn't work. I, it, that's a, I, it, it's really interesting to hear about that strategy. And I, 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 it's just an American. I'm wondering, you know, I can, I, I can sort of imagine give, Biden giving a, a, a remark, making remarks like that regarding his upcoming trip to Saudi Arabia, right, which is, Obviously, um, Julia, you know, the when I read your question, that's immediately where my mind went. Um, and, and I guess what I would say is um, I asked this question earlier about the frame, about how do you frame the war? Uh, do you accept this democracy versus autocracy frame? I think, you know, if you, which Biden sort of has to a certain extent. And I, I guess the way I look at it, it seems to me, you know, I don't know the man, I've never met the man. It seems to me that it's, it, it's something he kind of believes is the way it should be. And we've read reporting that he, he, he's really not comfortable with this, uh, this trip and, and the kind of embrace or, or not embrace, but you know, dealing with uh, Mohammed bin Salman, who, and uh, you know, he, he was more comfortable calling Saudi Arabia a pariah, right? But now we need you know, the, 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 the oil, right? That's the old, what's our, what's our oil doing under their sand, right? You know, <laughs> um, and, and it's there, it's because it's theirs. Um, I, I would I would also just connect this again to this whole autocracy democracy frame, which and maybe this is a little provocative, and I, I don't know, maybe Michael and, and Liana might disagree with me about this, but it's something I've worried a little bit about. In your some of your scenarios, in the Ukraine vic victory scenarios, one of the the medium term or long term things I wonder about is that you know Ukraine um, has been recoded in some ways in Western uh, discourse as a kind of avatar. Of liberal democracy, right? I mean, and the fight is about, say, you know, fighting on behalf of this liberal democracy against a brutal authoritarian government. And it's certainly true. And Michael, you talked about this, and Leon, you also talked about this, that that in recent years, you, Liana, you mentioned that Putin, the Russians had no idea what was happening inside Ukraine, and then that the democracy was. I think your implication there was that the democracy was consolidating in a way that they didn't understand because they were sort of hubristic about it, or maybe there was a kind of mirror imaging thing going on, right? Where they were like, oh, well, they're just like us. So they're not really Democrats. And Michael, you know, you talked about how um, uh, the, the um, I can't remember how you put it, but the, the same, you know, uh, issue where so with the passage of time, we've, we've actually seen Ukraine become this thing. And I, but I wonder, or you had talked about how, you know, uh, I guess it was that the legitimacy of Z uh, Zelensky was, was, was bound up in his election. I wonder though, whether, this sets a kind of expectation for Ukraine post post war, whether, whatever the resolution is, not just Ukrainian victory, about what Ukraine will be or what it should be after the war. That will be very difficult for Ukrainian political leadership to sort of meet those expectations. When you think about oh EU membership, for example, or some kind of association agreement. I mean, Ukraine is a country that even in the past eight years has struggled tremendously with basic issues of rule of law, corruption. Um, you know, and, and I just, I worry slightly looking at this, that um, there's going to be a gap between what we have, the way we have kind of recoded Ukraine and, and Ukraine's actual political reality um, once, once it, there's a stasis or a kind of resolution to the war. So sorry, Julia, that this wandered a little bit from your question, but I think it's related. I mean, I don't mean to sound like Henry Kissinger uh, in response to this uh, to this to this question, but I will a, a little bit. I think uh, in terms of um, the very difficult, perhaps tragic need in foreign policy to set priorities, and you know sometimes the options that you have are kind of uh, there's a, there's a sort of ruthlessness to to what they impose uh, upon you. But if inflation goes way out of control, 
uh, you know, sort of forget our Ukraine policy in a certain sense over the course of the next couple of years because it will fall victim to domestic politics, or it could. Uh, and so there's the competing priority of foregrounding human rights uh, and calling out countries for their deficits. Uh, and that's a, a very valid and important tradition. It's nice that Biden is committed to that. That's one priority. But the other priority is just keeping the whole operation going. And for that, you will need a basic degree of economic health. And that does take one to, you know, sort of access to, to oil for the U.S. And, and, and gas and oil for uh, for the Europeans. So a certain amount of realpolitik in that regard, I think is, uh, you know, I wouldn't want to applaud it, but I can see that the necessity of it uh, in a different sense. And of course, this opens up multiple kinds of Pandora's box. There's nothing new about it whatsoever. I mean, the whole Cold War was fought in exactly that spirit, where there are any number of deals made with any number of, of, of devils in the name of the Cold War. Sometimes, um, you know, if Kissinger comes to mind here in Latin America, sometimes really to the debit uh, of, uh, of the U.S. and its partners, but you think also of the war on terror. I mean, you know, again, there's a lot, most of it is to be critical of and, and not much to, to celebrate, but all kinds of deals that were struck uh, for the sake of national security, as it was then perceived with regimes like the Saudi one and, 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 and Pakistan, et cetera. So for American foreign policy, it's a real dilemma, but it's one of the oldest dilemmas I can, uh, I can think of. So we have lots of precedents to think through about how this can be done capably and what happens or how this can also go uh, off the rails. So we have two final questions. I will bundle them together. Uh, and then I think we can sort of segue from these final questions into maybe a few closing comments because the hour uh, is upon us. So from anonymous attendee, uh, is there any evidence that there is alternative leadership in Russia that might replace Putin and take a different course? And then from Lydia Lefebvre, uh, Liana mentioned that MH17 incident as an example of unpredictable events that can accelerate international reactions to the conflict. Given the volume of portable air defense technologies transferred to Ukraine, if an event like the MH17 incident traces back to weapons of Western origin, do you expect a similar major shift in international relations? So uh, mm. weapons provision and leadership in Russia. Uh, Justin, Liana, either of you wish to jump in first? I'm, I'm going to take a pass on both of those because I, I, I think they are really interesting questions and I simply don't know enough about either topic to, to say anything of value. Yeah, um, perhaps a quick take on the first question. I, I wish I could say more than just no, <laughs> but I'm actually afraid um, that this is the case. And I mean, the reason is that Putin, I mean, obviously any alternative leadership, which is not from his circle is dead or in exile. That's very clear. Um, and at the moment, I mean, he seems to be very jealous instead of guarding his own power, picking the people who have access to him. So um, I don't see I don't see that and also don't see that apart from you know giving himself the opportunity to stay in power um, uh, until for a couple of yeah for almost a decade more than a decade now um, he's all looking for any successor or making any plans on on that so really not 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 much more to say about this about the MH17 question I think the difference to 2014 is that the Ukrainian airspace is now closed I mean that was the pro one of the problems of 2014 that you know uh, airplanes were still allowed to fly at a level I think of 2000 meters or something which was I mean basically not uh yeah, not prudent given the kind of weapons that were on the ground in Eastern Ukraine at the time. But obviously we can imagine different scenarios. I mean, we can imagine a Russian bomb that, you know, I mean, they increasingly use bombs that are less um, sort of not precision guided, but, you know, just very, uh, very blind bombs that this comes very close to Polish territory and so on. I mean, I think these are scenarios that we could, that we could imagine where it is so important to, in case this happens and sort of the invisible lines are violated that we've discussed before, that there must be a channel where, you know, one side can call the other and say, you know, this, we, we or, or somehow signal that this was not on purpose because then we will end up in exactly the kind of crisis that, that we had in the Cold War. And as a very last point, I just want to underline the, the aspect that you just mentioned, Justin, because I think it is incredibly important how quickly Ukraine can fall from this position of model love country of everyone and can fall really deep, you know, because there's nothing easy in the public sphere to discuss, you know, falling of grace, 
you know, and there will be obviously political infighting in Ukraine. There are already questions now about, you know, why did the Ukrainian government deny an attack for such a long time? Um, and so there can be big disappointment um, uh, in Ukraine, in Ukraine's democracy. My hope is Ukrainian civil society. I mean, those who are not uh, on the front or dying right now, the Ukrainian civil society has just proven over the years to be so incredibly resilient in fighting corruption, especially, I have to say, women in Ukraine, which are incredibly powerful mm. and strong in that regard. So I would hope that you know, Ukrainian society, after waves of mobilization and protests and revolutions, will keep up this uh, spirit. Yeah, if anything, if anything could do it, it's this, yeah. yeah. I think I won't add to Liana's uh, answer to, to the question about MH17, we'll just say a few words about uh, Russian politics and leadership going back to the first paragraph of our second article in the series, you know, sort of coming home, <laughs> coming home as we as we conclude our discussion, this was what if Russia loses, uh, which I think was not the essay we were expecting to write. It's actually one of the, to me, one of the uh, nice things about looking at the dates that are attached to each of these essays that they sort of map, I think, for Liana and me and maybe for others, you know, sort of mental shifts uh, that occurred in real time in the course of this very unpredictable war. But the first paragraph of the second essay, What If Russia Loses, describes Russia's war as a strategic blunder for Russia. Now, my thinking ebbs and flows and changes and my mood changes and, you know, the news uh, is constantly changing. I continue to believe this. I think that this judgment is is correct, even if the Russians have done a bit better in the last 10 days than they did in the, the first 10 days of the war. Um, and if that's true, that will mean that for Russia's own security, the war will be a negative. It will mean that for Russia's economy, the war will be a negative. Uh, it will mean that for Russian society, you think of the loss of talented young people who have gone uh, abroad, that's certainly an objective uh, negative. You know, all countries have a kind of moral being. We could talk about all the ways in which the U.S. falls short uh, in its moral being as a, as a country. I think in this war, speaking of the brutality and the atrocities, that is, a, a, you know, sort of a, a something that will weigh heavily on the moral being of Russia as a country in very unpredictable, uh, unpredictable ways. But if you tally up all of these negatives, I don't doubt that Putin can navigate for the next six months or next year, maybe even even several years, but I think it will amount to a huge burden uh, on his presidency. He began as president of Russia with this wager that he could modernize the country and stabilize and even bring it into Europe in some ways or continue bringing it into Europe circa uh, 2000. Now, the isolation from Europe, yes, the global isolation is not complete, but the isolation from Europe is severe, uh, which is a tragedy uh, for Russian life and for Russian, uh, for Russian culture. So does that amount to a revolution? You know, probably not. But you know, go back into Russian history and think of 1905. Uh, and in 1905, Russia lost a war uh, against Japan. It sort of liberalized and reformed in some ways, but uh, there are, you know, ways in which Nicholas II never recovered from that loss. You can go back also to Nicholas I and the Crimean War, which is another lost war that had very, very great political repercussions. So if there is an undoing to Putinism, it will be this war. I'll sort of end on that. Uh, on that sentence. So we like if statements in these pieces, what if? So if, 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 <laughs> if there's an undoing to Putinism, then, uh, then through, this, through this war. But, uh, you know, Justin and Liana, it's been a joy to be with you, you know, sort of yes. in the course of this discussion and to be able to verbally talk through things that we've been going through, uh, through tracks changes and uh, <laughs> email uh, and in print form. Uh, and, you know, it's just a sort of joy to have this conversation and, and also wonderful to have a chance to engage with uh, with the audience and to get its excellent questions, let me simply say uh, in terms of absolute uh, conclusion that there will be upcoming Monterey conversations. Uh, keep a lookout for one with uh, Anton Trajanovsky of the New York Times and Joshua Yaffa of the New Yorker, two wonderful journalists who will speak about writing about the war press coverage uh, and, uh, and reporting. And there will be other Monterey conversations coming up, I think one or two more this summer and certainly many more uh, in the fall. I'd like to thank the Carnegie Corporation uh, of, uh, of New York for its support for the Monterey uh, conversations. I'd like also to thank Anna Vasilyeva, Jade, um, um, uh, Jade and Darleth, uh, um, for uh, Jade McGlynn and Darleth McGuckin for uh, all that they've done to make this uh, possible. 
Uh, and finally, once again, to thank Liana and Justin for taking the time uh, to join today. Uh, so with that, we'll draw to a close, but uh, so nice to see you both and hopefully we'll see all of the audience at future Monterey Conversations.